Okay, so this is Adam Quiney with Evergrowth Coaching. And um, what we're doing today is a trial run for something new. Uh, we're actually going to I'm going to record some video here and just see about answering some questions people had about coaching and um, see how that, that compares against doing things like blog posts and other forms of content. So first, a, a big thank you if you're watching this to the support and a huge thanks to the people that have provided support by giving me some questions to work with because that's, that's a... a <laughs> It's, it's harder to come up with that sort of stuff on, on your own because for me, it, I'm kind of like a fish. This is the water I swim in. So it, it all just feels um, just like something that is obvious and self-evident. So let's go to our first our first question comes from Lori and she asks, what what is coaching and what can it do for me? And I will start, I think, by just laying out what coaching is and isn't. Um, coaching is not a device to fix you or to change you outside of where you want to go. And it's also definitely not a process by which you're given advice or told what to do. I think this is a really common misconception. People, uh, especially my dad, think, oh, it must be so nice just being able to tell people what to do. We already do that. All of our friends tell us what to do. Our whole family tells us what to do. Our bosses at work tell us what to do. It's fun for the person telling someone else what to do. It never really has a very large impact. And it's annoying when you're the person being told what to do. That's not coaching. What coaching is, is uh, a tool. A tool that is used to empower our own growth and to get us moving outside of the comfort zone faster than we would otherwise. So really at its core, coaching is a process of inquiry. It's a process of working with someone that stands outside of your context, your paradigm, and can point to the stuff that you're not doing, the stuff that you can't see. We all have this thing back here that is effectively a blind spot. Uh, you know, to see is to have a blind spot. And we kind of operate from this place of assuming that, nope, I've got it all figured out. And if you've ever heard yourself or someone else talk about how things are going good and you've got it all handled and there are no real struggles or problems, <laughs> you can't see this thing because I guarantee you there's places in your life where things are stuck or they're just not moving forward in the way you want and your blind spot might show up in any number of ways. It might be difficulty being vulnerable. It might be difficulty admitting that there's some place where you could improve. So what coaching is, is a process of having someone enrolled, someone standing on your side that's completely committed to what you're up to, even and especially during those moments when you simply can't stand for that yourself. We all make big declarations. Uh, we have those moments where we see what we're truly capable of. And in those moments, we, we might pronounce or tell our friends or our family or even just ourselves if we've done this in the past and it hasn't worked out. We'll make pronouncements, grand declarations about what we're going to achieve. And then the next day, it becomes a little bit of a smaller declaration, and then a little bit smaller, and then a little bit smaller, until eventually we're right back to where we started. And we've got a whole bunch of circumstances and really good reasons, at least convincing for us, as to why that grand vision really wasn't what we actually wanted or where we should go. As a coach, I stand with people, I get them to see that large, impactful, powerful vision, and then I stand for them, especially when everything in their being is telling them, you know what, not actually such a good idea, I'm actually not interested in changing the world in that way because then I wouldn't be able to have my peace and quiet and tranquility, or whatever the opium looks like for them. So that's what coaching is, is having someone really enrolled in your success. It's a tool for people that are winning and want to win more. It's not for people that are stuck and mired and want someone to come and fix them. So coaching really requires you doing some heavy lifting. It provides a clarity of vision. It provides an access point. It's kind of like having a map in front of you. Suddenly you know and you can plan out your route and you can see how to get there. And you can even see some of the obstacles that are in your, that are in your way. But you still have to walk or drive the car or actually take the steps yourself. The second part to Lori's question is, what can coaching do for me? Um, and 
there's really a lot. The the core is that coaching can accelerate your your for lack of a better word, your process. So the way life typically works is that we're traveling along, going about life. We're maybe progressing along some kind of incline. And we've got stories about what's possible, what isn't possible. Maybe I know it to be true that it's embarrassing for me to ask for support and there's no way that I can do that. And if I ask for support, people see me as weak and pathetic and they'll, they're going to tell me no anyhow. So I've got a whole bunch of stories set up that limit what I can do. Because of that story, I'm not going to go and ask someone else for support, even when that might be the very thing that's going to move me forward most powerfully. And if support's not your thing, don't worry, you've got something else. We all do. Life, at times, throws us a curveball. It comes and it punches us in the kidney and it says, guess what? Now you don't have an option but to challenge that story. So perhaps I've got that story about support and a tornado comes and blows out all the windows in my house. Suddenly, I don't have an option. I need to ask for support. I've got to go next door and say, hey, do you have cardboard and tape? Or can I eat some of your meat? Or I don't know what, I don't know what, clearly I don't know what asking for that support would look like. I guess when you've been hit by a tornado, you need cardboard, tape, and meat. In any event, what happens is that we suddenly have to operate outside of our comfort zone because of what life has handed us. And at the end of that, we may go one of two ways. We may revert back and and think to ourselves, well, the only reason that it was okay to ask for support there was because a tornado struck my house. So it, now I know in cases where it's extremely important, then I can ask for support, but not otherwise. Or we may have a complete breakthrough. We might actually realize, holy cow, when I ask for support, I noticed that people actually felt really grateful that I came to them and were really happy to provide me that opportunity. That was really cool. Maybe support isn't the way I think it is. So the process of life kind of looks like a sine wave. We have moments where we're, we're traveling up and then breakdowns and then breakthroughs. And ideally, we want to have those breakthroughs create a higher curve than the last point. What coaching does is it allows us to create those moments intentionally. So sometimes that, that kidney punch that life is going to hand you will be in support when really the thing that would move your career forward the most powerfully would be a breakthrough in the area of showing up powerfully for you. That's a little redundant, but perhaps actually showing up authentically and from a place of real intention at work. It's great that you've gotten that breakthrough and support, but maybe you have to wait for the second kidney punch a few years later before you actually change your leadership style. With coaching, we identify where do you want to go and we develop clarity. What's in the way right now? And really get clear. Is it something related to your leadership? Is it something related to the way you show up as a leader? And then we operate to move you beyond that, to get you outside of that predictable story that you've got. So it's a process of actually identifying what's the breakdown that you're avoiding? What's the breakthrough on the other side? What might actually be possible there? Get you clear on what would be in it for you to, to push through that and then to have you supported in actually creating that in your life. So it's kind of like hastening or speeding up the process that life naturally has and allowing us to really be directive and intentional. This is the way I'm going to move forward. I'm going to create the breakdown and the breakthrough going in this direction instead of where life typically operates, which is kind of like a little bit over here and then a little bit over there. And now there's going to be a breakthrough over here. So a friend of mine once told, once described it as getting there sooner. Coaching is a way to get there sooner. We're all going to get there. Our life is going to happen the way it happens and we're going to have our breakdowns and breakthroughs. Coaching enables us to move that velocity and that momentum a little further up the scale. Thanks for that question, Laurie. Okay, uh, Grady asks, how to dream bigger goals and have something huge to work towards? So some people, they will probably have an experience of this. Boy, it's hard to come up with goals that are really empowering and that are exciting. Other people, they live exclusively in this area. They only have humongous goals, goals so big that they're overwhelming and then they kind of set it down because it's too big, it's too dreamy. There's no way that they could ever make that happen. At the heart of Grady's question is another question and this is kind of an example of how coaching operates. The first thing I would want to know is what's getting in Grady's way that has dreaming bigger goals and coming up with something huge a challenge? What is it that's actually stopping him from creating that? 
typically whenever there's a lack of something in, in our lives, the place we want to look is how are we creating that? And this can be really frustrating for if not anyone being coached, at least me, because it means I'm responsible for it. If I have an, a, an experience of girls never want to date me or nice guys always finish last, the, the really the powerful place to look, and of course the, the last place I'm going to look, is internally. How am I creating it so that nice guys finish last? How am I creating it so that girls don't like me? What am I doing? What is, what is it that I'm up to that's actually having that happen? So that's a bit of a coachy answer to Grady's question, which hopefully is what you came here for. But I think that that is the core of this. What's getting in the way of dreaming bigger goals? Now, there's a whole bunch of tools that we can provide our coaching clients in moments like this. They can go to TED Talks and watch videos that really inspire them. They can read inspiring books. They can go and just chat with people and ask them, what are your big visions? What's the crazy stuff that you are up to? They can um, go to the library. There's an endless fount of opportunity and tools out there to support something like this. So it again comes back to, how are you keeping that stuff out? How are you blocking that? And I'm just scanning to see if there's anything else I want to add here. This is this is the the this is a common place for people to be. I often have people come to me, and their their request is, Adam, I'd, I'd like to procrastinate less. Wouldn't we all? And they they are hoping that I've got a silver bullet, a magic tool I can give them, or a system that will have them stop procrastinating. The, the thing is, the good news and the bad news is that you don't need any tools to stop procrastinating. We all know what to do. We just do the bloody work. If we just put down Facebook, logged out, and worked solidly for two hours, we would stop. We would get our work done and procrastination wouldn't be an issue. So the key question there is, what is it that actually has you avoiding your work? What is underneath that? For some people, it's simply, I don't like my job, which is funny because there really is no greater waste than trying to do efficiently that which you shouldn't do in the first place. And this is a, a key example of that. And so in that question, it's a fantastic question for people to bring to the session because there's so much underneath it. There's judgment about how they're currently spending their time as though it's wrong for them to divide their time up the way they do. So we can hear that they're actually disempowered in how they're working. There's the opportunity to look at what is it about your work that has you continuing to do that? Is it that you feel hedged in? Is it that you don't feel you have options? Is it that you're simply stuck and you know, you're being forced to do this job under duress? What is it? What's got you procrastinating? What has you avoiding it? And sometimes it really has nothing at all to do with the job. It might relate to issues around embarrassment. I'm embarrassed that if I hand this in, there's so much significance around it People are going to, there's no way I can possibly do it right. Perfectionists, people that are perfectionists often struggle with this too. There's a reason that they're, they're aiming for perfection, likely because they've got a story that they're one misstep away from the ultimate screw up, the scroogey, or that if they do, when they finally do hand it in, they're, oh shoot, there's always going to be that one other thing that they could have done a little bit better and it reflects on them somehow. So... These questions are great questions to explore with a coach because your solution, and when I say your, I'm talking about mine just as much as anyone else, is going to be to kind of try to operate in a manner to create more things you can do. So for example, I'd like to share sort of a piece from my life. I realized two years ago now, perhaps, I was struggling with connection. I was actually pretty lonely. And everyone that knows me knows I'm very personable, outgoing. I love to have the spotlight on me. Um, I enjoy telling jokes and I love making people laugh. If, if I could have it my way, I'd be the life of the party. And yet I was really lonely. I would read books that would provide tools to break out of this. Do this more, do that more. Call people by their first name. Learn people's names smile at people, make eye contact. The irony is that all of this doing, which led me to a kind of mentality, 
if I just read maybe one more book, maybe two more books, maybe that third book is the one that'll actually have the piece that'll, that'll change it. And I would take these and apply them inside my comfort zone. I would do the exact kind of all of this new growth and work with people that I was already comfortable with. The fact was that there was a select group of people that were safe for me to connect with and everyone else only got this superficial kind of level of Adam. It wasn't until I started working with a coach that I could even see this. To me, this thing back here, this blind spot I had looked like, hey, I'm reading books, I'm doing the stuff, I'm moving there, I'll get there eventually, it's just a matter of staying on my path. So, a very long-winded answer for Grady. Grady, thanks so much for that question. Patrick asks, how can, he's got a couple questions here. So first, and they're, they're kind of connected, how can you stay motivated when you're in the endless middle of your progress? And how do you evaluate success and get the tangible feeling of accomplishment for work done in the middle? I, Patrick, this is such a great question. And thank you so much for, uh, for providing me this. Um, so I think this is a really common problem for most people, and especially the, the, the people that I specialize in working with, high-performance professionals, often struggle with this. We, we are the sort of people that see a goal, we achieve it, and immediately are looking one, if not two, three, four goals ahead. We're always focused on what's next, and often what's next after that and after that. It's almost like people that live their lives like a chess game a little bit. Once I jump through that hoop and that hoop and then get through there and under that pipeline and then there we go, then life will be perfect. And of course, it's a never-ending goalpost. It's continually moving away. And in a lot of ways, that's the way life is. We are always going for the next goal. There's nothing wrong with that other than the fact that we're, sh we're focusing on the wrong thing. We're focusing on what should I do next? What can I do? What can I do? Instead of how am I being? How am I being while I do this? Let's get back to Patrick's question. So one of the things I see in this question is perhaps someone that assigns goals and sees it as a start and an end and then just this long, unending process in the middle. One of the things I work with clients like this on is to actually create milestones along the way and to generate rewards for those milestones, for achieving that milestone. Now, high-performance professionals love to tell me, well, getting that milestone will be reward in itself, which is bullshit. Speaking as a high-performance professional, we, that won't, it's not reward in itself. It's actually a trap. It's a trick that we play on ourselves. When we get there, we immediately are looking for the next thing and the next thing. It's almost like an addiction, the next fix. So one of the things that I really advocate is create milestones and create rewards that you actually want. The other way that people will sometimes sabotage this is they'll create rewards that they're going to get anyhow. So if they don't meet that milestone, oh well, no big deal, I still wanted those shoes, I'm going to get them. So it's important to create rewards that are truly a reward. They don't have to be something big. It can be like an extra 300 calories that day, like a blizzard from Dairy Queen. Or it can be a new pair of shoes, if you're of a similar persuasion to myself. And it can be a vacation that you might not otherwise take. But the important thing is that you're willing to keep that as a reward and not to just give it to yourself willy-nilly. Let's go to the second part. So how do you evaluate success and get the tangible feeling of accomplishment for work done in the middle? I think I've mostly answered this question already. So one, we really want to create milestones and actually have some rewards so that you are celebrating achieving that milestone. And a lot of people have a fairly, be, be, perhaps because of our parents, the way we were raised, the way we learned, the, the stories that we put together as a child growing up about the way the world works, we've learned that the nature of work is you don't celebrate midway through or that you don't celebrate achieving something because, hey, everyone should just be doing that and there's nothing special about that particular milestone that you achieved. So we want to attach that. The other thing that I hear kind of underneath this question is someone that might be focusing on what they're doing instead of how they're being. And again, this is, this is the muscle that we, have, we as society have really developed. What am I doing? Am I doing the right things? Is everything that I'm doing the, the stuff that I ought to be doing to be successful? As a coach, and especially as an ontologically trained coach, 
I, I almost don't care what people are doing. That's not entirely true, but what I mean is that I'm much more interested in how they're being as they're doing it. So, for example, if someone shows up to me every session and gives me this list of all the things they're doing and is talking about how they're, they're not seeing any of the success they want, the first place I'm going to look is, well, how are you being? Because if someone's making calls and meeting up with people and going to minglers, but all the while they're being a victim or withdrawn or isolated or just going through the motions, that's going to have an impact. People, all of us, can pick up on someone's being. You've probably had an experience where you go to the store and you say to someone, hey, how's it going? As you're getting your groceries pushed through and the person goes, fine. They're telling you, fine, they're doing the conversation, but as far as how they're being, they're being kind of withdrawn, exhausted, maybe disconnected. It's probably annoying for people because as a coach, I'm tuned, my ear is tuned to that. And so I always ask them, oh, really, it, it sounds like, like your being sounds kind of off. It sounds like you're feeling pretty tired and it might have been a long day. Now, I'm not suggesting that we do that all of us do that with strangers, although it would probably be a better world if we were actually that honestly concerned with the people in our lives' well-being. But what I am suggesting is developing a muscle around your own being. Start to actually look at how you're being as you're going through your goal. Are you being exhausted? Are you being bored? Are you being tired? And if so, what do you need to actually create what you do want? How do you want to be? Do you want to be happy? Great. How could you actually inject some happiness in your daily lives? So really start to develop this weak muscle that most of us have no experience working with and develop the ability to start generating an awareness of how you're showing up. How are you being in the moment? It's a very powerful distinction and it's one that most, if not all of us, have a very limited ability to apply. Okay, last question is from Sonia. Sonia from Berlin. And Sonia asks, how do you find balance between working towards a big goal and staying present? So typically, if, if a client came to the session with me with this question, the first thing I would want to know is I would want to explore that. What, what is it like when you have a big goal? How do you operate with a big goal? Where do, you, where do you go with that? And how are you being, of course? Finding a balance, usually to me, it's a bit of a misnomer. When we talk about things like, I'd like work-life balance, I'd like more balance, really what we mean is, I want more of something. And so, it sounds like, in this question, how do you find a balance between working towards a big goal and staying present, that what this person wants to create is more presence. What's getting in the way of presence? So this is the first place I would look. What is it that has you lose your presence, moment to moment, or hour to hour, or month to month, on a big goal. What is it that you lose your the ability to stay present to? And another thing that I often give clients as a practice is keep track of how long you're able to stay present. How long does it usually go? What's your threshold? I think for me it's about 30 milliseconds before I'm you know in the middle of a task and already like I wonder what is on Wikipedia. I wonder what Miley Cyrus did just recently. I wonder how far a beetle can leap on a normal day. This is how my mind works. And so the first thing to start to take a look is to just get a feel of the lay of the land. How long can I stay present? And then to start noticing, what is it that keeps pulling my presence away? Is it distraction, sort of like mine? Or is it emergencies? Am I spending a lot of time working on urgent rather than important stuff? What do I actually lose sight of? Do I lose sight of the big goal? or my purpose, why I'm actually doing it? Or do I lose sight of the small tasks? When we can start to see patterns, and the thing that almost none of us really want to accept, and that's almost universally true, is that as humans, we're patterns. We're machines that are running our patterns. We've got scripts that operate inside our head, and they just play out. They play out, and they play out. And often we're unaware of the fact that this pattern showing up over here is the same as this pattern showing up over here. The, the little bits, the, the components that are currently playing out, the players in that game might look different. But if we actually abstract away, we can see that underneath it's the same pattern. So for example, my 
pattern around disconnection and not connecting with people would show up with acquaintances. It would show up at parties. It would show up at a job. It would show up all over the place. The beautiful thing about this is that when we attack the pattern rather than the the overlying content, when we attack what's actually underneath and create transformation there, all of this stuff changes because suddenly the bedrock that it's lying on has shifted and we have a new place to stand. So the beauty of this form of coaching, of ontological coaching and actually looking at how we're being is that suddenly what we're doing can shift radically and all over the place because we're, we're changing that underlying pattern. So working towards a big goal and staying present, what are the patterns? And lastly, the thing that we want to do is generate some awareness. The first thing that is necessary to change anything is really get some awareness about what's going on. How often do I stay, like, when do I get present? When am I most present? What typically gets in the way of it? That gives us the, the starting point to then start to look, what is it that's actually getting in the way? Is it even about presence? Is it about the fact that it's a big goal or do I actually become less present on a small goal, but it's just more palpable because a big goal takes longer to achieve? So we really want to look at both the top, the actions, as well as the bottom, the being, and make sure that we're addressing both of those and really getting clear on what we're changing. The sad thing for most people and you've probably heard yourself say this a few times yourself, is that we operate, we, we, we do what I like to call shifting the chairs on the sinking ship. <clears throat> we have patterns, ways of being that are playing out. So for example, we might experience that no matter what, it seems like we're always busy at work. People often come to me in the middle of their breakdown thinking that's the best time to work with a coach. There's no wrong time to work with a coach, but the best time is usually when things are either right at the bottom or right at the top, because that's a great place for us to spring off the top of that into the next wave. Nevertheless, people come to me and they'll say, oh, I'm always busy at work. I just never have spare time and I'd like more spare time. And we'll, we'll work together a little bit. And at the end of it, they'll say, well, that was really great. And I think, you know, I think I've got it sorted out and I'm going to, you know, I appreciate it, but I'm just going to, I'm going to keep doing some things. I've got some stuff in mind. You know, I've hired a person and I'm going to have them take on some stuff off my plate and I think it'll all be different. So thank you, but I've got it sorted out. Now, what's predictable is actually not at all that it gets sorted out because it's not a lack of people or something like that in this person's life. It's the way they're showing up. They're creating that scarcity of time. And so they're actually, rather than creating something new and assessing, looking at that underlying pattern, they're just rearranging these chairs that exist over top of that. And it doesn't matter how they change the order of this, until they fix that bedrock, they're not gonna actually see lasting transformative change. So this is one of the pieces that, that I don't care for when it comes to facilitative coaching. This will just, I'll just finish up on this note. Typically in facilitative coaching, it's almost like working with a personal project manager. You identify your steps, you identify what you want to take on next, and then you take the actions required to get there. Now that might get you over whatever humps are currently showing up, but if you don't transform, if you don't actually look at the piece underneath at how you're being, all of those changes, uh, sorry, all of those problems, they're going to show up in the next project because it's how you're being that is creating them. We can rearrange those chairs and make it look a lot better for the next hour, but eventually that ship's gonna go under. We're gonna have to change things around sooner or later and jump to a new ship, jump to an inner tube, whatever. My metaphor's starting to fall apart now. So uh, I have a feeling, a sinking feeling that I didn't answer Sonia's question at all, but hopefully uh, I did provide some value there. So, Lori, Grady, Patrick, Sonia, thank you so much for your questions. And please, everyone out there, send me more questions. I'm very eager to get them. I enjoy doing this. Uh, I like the sound of my own voice. Hopefully you do too. And your questions make this possible. It allows me to actually have a dialogue instead of to just talk into a screen and hope that I'm touching or reaching someone somewhere. So any questions you have can go to adam at evergrowthcoaching.com. And I encourage you to check out our website as well, uh, www.evergrowthcoaching.com. 
my wife Bay and I both create quite a bit of content generally weekly and it's well worth your time to check out. So thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.